<laughs> All right. So I want to talk today. Well, I want to read a scripture first. I got a text message from someone this week, a scripture they texted me that I needed to hear. And it was so timely. And it's Jeremiah 33:3. 3. Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not yet know. So how many here can agree that we don't know everything about God? If you didn't raise your hand, I'm assuming you know everything about God. Chris, no? <laughs> okay. My husband and I have been on a journey these last couple years that we were hoping we wouldn't have to take. Um, I'm going to talk about healing. And I want to share with you our journey because I feel like God has been teaching us some really important things about his nature, who he is, and about our relationship with him in our understanding of healing and God's miraculous power. And so for the last two years, for those of you who don't know, I had to apologize to a dear friend this week because she didn't know. I, I just failed to mention it to her, I think, because we've just been so busy seeing doctors and whatnot. My husband has a genetic kidney disorder that causes cysts to grow on his kidneys. And over the years, enough cysts grow and destroy healthy kidney tissue that the kidneys no longer function. So he's got down to 8% kidney function, and it was time for him to start dialysis. So he's been on dialysis since April. And in the midst of doing that, he developed an abdominal hernia. And so now we're dealing with that and a possible another surgery. And also pursuing the live kidney donor option. So there's a lot going on. While all this was going on, we sold a house, sold three quarters of what we had, moved in with dear friends of ours for three months, built an apartment at our son's house, moved again within three months into that apartment, and this has all happened within the last two years. So suffice it to say, there's been a lot going on. Some of the change has been really good, and we faced some pretty real disappointments. And when you are facing disappointments, especially in regards to your health, um, because that particular thing can feel like the most out of your control. If you've got money issues, okay, that's a problem, but you at least feel like, oh, I can go make more money, or I could do this, or I could do that. And with healing, it feels like that's kind of out of your hands. You do what you can do with what medical science provides for you, but other than that, it's all in God's hands at that point. It's been an adventure for us to navigate it. Um, we have been seeking healing for him for the last two years. And praying and asking God and, Lord, teach me, how does this happen? You know, going over healing scriptures, speaking the word, praying, laying hands, doing whatever we knew to do. And my husband still isn't healed. So there's a whole boatload of emotions that come with that. And I'm not here to, um, to talk about a bunch of negative things and to talk about um, to be negative about anything. What I'm here to tell you is the journey we've been on and how God has entered into that and what he's done. And so with this boatload of emotions that go on, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Who here can relate to the roller coaster of feelings and emotions in regards to healing or anything that goes on in your life? Who has questions? If you don't have questions, 
then I would challenge you to start asking more questions, because that's exactly what I've been doing. I have had nights where I have cried out to God with a broken heart, saying, "I don't understand." He's a good man. He has served you for decades. He sacrifices for other people. He's a pleasure to you. I don't understand. And I got silence. So here were some of the questions, because I am. Absolutely sure that many of you, if not all of you, have had these questions. Why isn't everyone healed? If we believe that God heals everyone, why isn't everyone healed? Jesus could have spoken one word when he was here on the earth, one word, and healed the entire world of every sickness and disease, but he didn't do that. That's another. That's my question. How do we get healing to work? <laughs> What should we believe or not believe? There's so much stuff out there, and it can be very confusing. Some people say, "Well, you're not healed because your faith is too small." Well, when I read the healing stories in the Bible, Jesus healed people at every level of faith. Even the guy who said, "I do believe, help my unbelief," and he still got healed. So that answer doesn't work for me. Some people say, "Well, God just blesses some people and not others." That's a bunch of bull. That's just not true. That is absolutely untrue. And so, all of these quick, quip answers we get sometimes, and people are well-meaning; they really want to help. But oftentimes, these answers can cause more damage than they do good. And these answers are our way of trying to understand, with our own minds, an eternal God who has provided healing for everyone. And we're going to go over that. Are there obstacles to healing? Am I doing something wrong? Oh my gosh! Did I go round and round with that one? What am I doing wrong? Do I need to fast? Do I need to read my Bible more? Do I need to pray for him like six times a day and lay hands on him? Do we need to go to a healing house? Do I need to find someone who's got the gift of healing and have them pray over him? All of this stuff going through my mind. Does God even want to heal him? Very legitimate question. We saw our middle son years ago. I want you to look up, right about there. That ceiling tile. He was in this attic up there. He fell through the ceiling tile to the cement floor. And three weeks later, he was playing ice hockey. The first miracle was that he had no internal bleeding, because any EMT knows a fall from that height onto cement, your organs burst and you die of internal bleeding within minutes. Didn't happen. Got him to the hospital. He had three fractures in his hip. Three weeks later, the doctor couldn't even see the fractures on the X-ray. My son was miraculously healed by the power of God. So why hasn't God healed my husband? I know he can do it. I'm being very real with you today. And again, why are some people healed and not others? Why does it seem so random to us? Why does it seem so random? And why do children get sick and some die? That can seem like the cruelest thing of all. I am not going to be able to answer a single one of those questions. Not one of them. Right? I don't think anybody can. We can try, but what I am going to tell you is a story of a treasure hunt, and the treasure that was found that was so much greater than any answers to any of those questions. 
I know we've been pursuing supernatural healing here, and we've seen some, but not a great deal. Trying to understand God's healing power. And how, how do we manifest it in, in greater numbers? How does that happen? You know, I, I often like to, um, I follow Bill Johnson from Bethel Church, and I listen to a lot of the messages and some of the worship. It's very excellent. They've experienced tremendous healings, and I was listening to him speak in an interview, and he said that, he made the statement that about 70% of the people that get prayed for get healed. Now, that's a huge number, as far as I'm concerned. But he said something else very interesting. He said, most of those people are not even from this church. They visit this church. And a lot of those people get healed in the midst of worship and nobody ever lays hands on them. And that's very interesting. I want to just say that I absolutely, without a doubt, believe that God heals. I do believe that he wants everyone to be whole and healthy. That remains unshaken in me. I don't have answers to those questions, but I do believe in a good God. Jesus himself talked about this when he spoke at the synagogue and read from the scriptures. There were three things that were accomplished at the cross. We, we tend to talk about one of them primarily, but there were actually three things. They are talked about several times in the Bible. And this scripture he read from the Old Testament. But this is what was accomplished. I'll read the scripture to you. When Jesus came to Nazareth, this is in Luke 4.19. And by the way, the name Nazareth is taken from the Hebrew word branch or sprout. Where he had been raised, he went into the synagogue, as he always did on the Sabbath, and when he came to the front to read the scriptures, they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and read where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to be poor, hope for the poor, freedom for the brokenhearted, and new eyes for the blind, and to preach the prisoners, you are set free. You have come, I have come to share the message of Jubilee, for the time of God's great acceptance has begun. The time of God's great acceptance. Wow. I think that's a pretty powerful statement. So what this scripture is telling us is what the cross did is freedom from sin, prosperity, never in lack, and healing. Those were the three things that were all included in the cross that can't be argued away, Jesus said it himself. It's said several times in the New Testament. This is what the cross has done. So you cannot convince me that healing isn't for all of us. On that, I am unshakable. And there's lots of healing scriptures in the Bible. There's 39 stories where Jesus did a miraculous work. 39 of them. And those are only the ones that were written down. And I can't remember which one of the disciples, it may have been Paul, wrote, if we were to record all the things, all the miracles that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books to contain them. So those are only the ones we know about. There's just a few. There's the issue of blood. Jesus is in a whole crowd of people, and they're pressing on him. And this woman who's had this bleeding problem for years gets in there and she this is her mindset if I can just touch the hem of his garment I'll be healed that was her faith level that's where she was at Jesus didn't even know who she was or that he, she was there Jesus is God but he didn't even know he didn't know but what he did say is I felt power go out of me who touched me he felt the power go out of him. Then there's the lame man. He couldn't walk. They brought him in. Jesus looks at him and he goes, he didn't say this, he didn't go, dude, 
you're healed. Get up and walk. Now, mind you, he hadn't even gone to the cross yet. He looked at him and he said, your sins are forgiven. Take your bed up and go home. Because that's what that man needed revealed to him. He needed revealed to him that his sins were forgiven. And in the midst of understanding that revelation, he was instantaneously healed. Then there's the centurion. Servant is sick. He comes to Jesus. I need you to pray for healing for my servant. Jesus says, I'll go home with you. And he says, oh, no, you don't have to come with me. I'm a man who understands authority. I have men under my authority. And when I tell them to do something, they go do it. You are a man with authority. And when you tell demons and sickness to go, they go. All you have to do is say the word. And Jesus said, all right. And he said it. And the servant was healed instantly. And Jesus said, no greater faith have I seen in all of Israel than what this centurion, a Roman soldier, displayed. Because this Roman soldier understood something about the kingdom of God from his understanding of how the Roman kingdom operated with authority. He understood and he grasped that revelation so Jesus healed in a myriad of different ways. He spit into mud. He put it on a guy's eyes. He had someone go dip in the dirtiest river in Israel seven times. It's like there's a ton of different ways that Jesus healed. And the reason I say this to you is we can't put God in a box. And we can't say... These are the ways I know about, so those are what I'm going to pursue. We need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Because Jesus himself said this, I only do what I hear and see the Father doing. That's it. When Jesus went to the pool of Bethsaida, he only healed one man. Not everyone there got healed. Because that's what he saw the Father doing. Why it happened that way? I don't know. And I'm in a place in my own heart where that doesn't even matter to me anymore because there's something more important. Then there's the scary question. I debated whether to throw this out there, but those of you who know me know that if I'm not real, I'm probably invisible. Here's the scary question, and I've asked this question. What if my husband goes through his life and he's never healed? What if? It is not wrong to explore these questions. God is not falling off his throne because you ask these questions. In fact, it's damaging to your heart to ignore the disappointments and the questions that you have and not bring them to God. That's one thing I've learned in all of this. It is damaging to my heart to not bring those questions to God. Because he knows all things. Questions are always good. Because when you seek out understanding together with God, it nurtures a more intimate relationship with him. And your faith is built. That was lesson number two. Delayed answers are not bad. They're faith builders. If you choose to allow them to be. God doesn't always delay. And when I say delay... We think he's delaying because it didn't happen on our timetable and our way. But making a statement based on lack of faith or understanding, it's not good. You've drawn a conclusion with no input from God and your own natural thinking. And that's pretty easy to do. 
Because in the busyness of life, we forget to stop a moment and ask the Holy Spirit questions. Any question will do. He doesn't care. He's not a discriminator of questions. <laughs> he doesn't care how silly you might think the question is, or even if you think that there is no question that's offensive to God. None. Not one. You're not going to shake his confidence. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, oh my God, she doesn't believe the right thing about me. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? That's not what's going on. See, we tend to project on God the way we think and the way we feel instead of getting into his intimate presence and saying, what do you think, God? What are you feeling? Where are you in the midst of this, Jesus, and what are you doing? Holy Spirit, let me ask you this question. You need to ask him and then experience him as your creator and your father in the midst of all those questions and all of that difficulty. The most paramount thing I learned in the midst of this, and it's going to sound like a quick, easy answer, but it's much deeper, is trust. I thought I trusted God. I really did. And then all of this started to happen, and all of a sudden I realized that a lot of what I thought was trust in God was my own mental aerobics of figuring things out and coming up with an answer. I was trusting in the answers that I was coming up with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil and it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Okay, what this scripture is saying to me is that my heart is a lot bigger than my head. My heart can handle a whole lot more understanding of who God is than my head can. So why am I trusting in my head? Why am I trying to figure this healing thing out so that I can get it right and my husband can get healed? Why am I doing that? Because we have a need for answers. We like having things figured out. We like knowing what to expect. And the minute God doesn't do what we want him to do, like a puppet on a string, who do we get upset with? God. I didn't write the scripture reference down. I'm so sorry. I didn't write it down for that one. Um, I would have told you I wasn't angry with God. But as I really began to seek God's heart, I realized I was angry with God because he didn't act the way I expected him to. Little did I know he had something far greater in mind than my limited thinking. Here's the issue with the mind. If, if I can understand with my mind everything that's going on in my life, in my Christian life, everything that's happening, then I have just reduced God to my size. How many of you here want a God that's no bigger than you? I don't. I don't. But the minute I depend on my own mind, my own logical reasoning based on circumstances, to define who God is and what he's doing, I've made him itty bitty 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 bitty. That was another lesson I learned. <laughs> the 
the other thing that I really learned in all of this is really important. And I, I kept trying to think how to communicate this because sometimes God shows you things and you have trouble finding words to communicate it to other people. So I'm going to try my best with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's really important. Revelation from God is good bread and food for us, and he gives that to us all the time. There also needs to be a healthy amount of mystery in your heart and your life. In other words, things you just don't know, and you don't have the answer to, and they're wrapped up in mystery. Mystery and revelation are two sides of the same coin called trust. When you have mystery in your life, in this case, why isn't my husband healed? And it goes, in my perception, it, it lacks a direct answer from God. I have two choices. I can either let that mystery cause me to doubt and fear and begin to pull away from God, or I can allow that mystery to drive me deeper into intimacy with him for hunger for greater understanding. That's why mystery plays such an important role. There are some things that are going to be wrapped up in mystery, and at some point you have to choose to be able to rest with that. I'm not going to use the word comfortable because I don't feel like I should ever get comfortable with it because it's the discomfort that pushes me on, <laughs> but to be able to rest with it, knowing that God is good, that he does heal, and that I can trust him. So being able to accept the fact that there's going to be a certain amount of mystery that you, you don't understand. God gives revelation to some mysteries in your life, and then new mysteries pop up. And that's the way that works, and it's designed that way on purpose, because it drives us closer to him. We are supposed to increase in understanding, and that's really important. Um, because that understanding is oftentimes what can bring the revelation and that aha movement. So always seek understanding, but be able to rest in mystery as well. Mystery provides the reason for trust, because <laughs> those are the things we can't explain or control, and mystery provides that reason for trust. So the mystery happens. Don't have any direct answer from God. It gives me a reason to trust him because now I have to step out of my own natural thinking, out of my own realm. I have to step into the realm of his heart, wrapped up in mystery, and trust. And that is another big lesson I've learned in the midst of this. Trusting God in the midst of not knowing, not understanding. I find that it's in the midst of those moments that I see God's goodness the most. I can, I'll be honest with you, God could like give my husband two brand new kidneys today and I'd be hooting and hollering and I'd be flying high for weeks, months, but I can almost guarantee you a year or two from now, the memory of that miracle would begin to fade away and what am I left with? What am I left with? I'm left with a God who loves, who's passionate about us, who wants intimate relationship with us. That's what I'm left with. 
And if I haven't been pursuing that all along and only the miracle, I'm going to be on pretty sandy soil. I remember a story that uh, my husband and I went to uh, Bangladesh years ago on a missions trip, and uh, Bob McGurdy, the missionary that we were working with over there, told us a story that oh, so impacted me. God will heal anybody, anytime. Believer, not believer, trust him, don't trust him, doesn't matter. He is kind of random in that regard. <laughs> but there's always a purpose and a reason behind what he does. We just don't always understand it. And he told this story of um, they were having a clinic because he's a, a nurse. His wife is also a nurse. And they were having a medical clinic and they were giving people medicine and whatnot. And this man came in, this uh, Bengali man, he was blind for many, many years. And they were praying over people and they prayed over him. And he was instantly healed, he could see. And then they went about their business. And the man got up to leave, and then he came back, and he tapped Bob on the shoulder. He goes, you're going to pray for me in the name of a God I don't know, and he gives me my sight, and you're not going to tell me who he is? So when God does perform the miraculous, the point in the end game is not the miraculous. It's entry into a deeper intimacy and a deeper knowledge of him. And that's where that needs to be taken. And that can happen with or without the miraculous. God does the miraculous because he loves us. It's part of who he is. It's part of the finished work of the cross. But it's that intimate relationship that sustains you, not the miracle. Now, when this scripture talks about acknowledging God in all your ways, that word acknowledge actually means to counter, encounter, and interact with. And so what it's saying is to encounter and interact with God in every area of your life, your work, your hobbies, your family, everything. Because God is... The Holy Spirit is the great educator. Are you a musician? He is the great musician. Interact with him in the midst of your music. Are you a mother? He is the great parent. Interact with him in the midst of your parenting. Are you a... Let me think here. Are you an auto repair mechanic? He is the best auto repair mechanic you could ever encounter. Interact with him in the midst of your job. He's got things to tell you and show you that you didn't yet know. And he wants to. He's eager to. He wants to enter into your life with you, not be the separate part of your life over here that you go to on Sunday morning or maybe a few mornings a week or... You know, he wants to be a constant part of your life. And I said earlier about we have the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit with us, always, but then there's that intimate presence that communicates with us on a continual basis in the midst of everything. Now, one of the things we tend to do, you know, in talking about um, mentioning the baptism of the Holy Spirit and talking about the Holy Spirit was we were in, imbued with power from on high. Now the power we tend to focus on, there, there's, there's two different aspects of that power. The power we tend to focus on is the power for the miraculous. And it's very real, it's very needed, it's very valuable. But we tend to focus on that and we tend to emphasize that for, for miracles and breakthrough. But the other side of the outpouring of the Spirit was also power for endurance. Christ 
endured the cross for the joy set before him. And the Bible tells us we're going to need endurance. And so I have been learning, and my husband has been learning endurance in the midst of this. That is a valuable gift. And we are learning how valuable that gift actually is. I can't emphasize how important this, this issue is. Because when things don't happen the way that you thought they would, or you have the appearance of a delayed answer, we live in a society where everything's quick and instant. And, you know, heaven forbid you should go on your laptop or your tablet or your computer and you click to go on a website and it takes more than two seconds for it to come up. Zero endurance. Zero endurance. <laughs> and we live in a world where our endurance level is so weak that, man, if we don't get it right away, it, it, go to a restaurant. If you've got to wait more than 10 minutes for your food, I've seen people get ticked off. Instead of thinking, you know what, I'm here, I'm going to relax, so what if it takes a half hour for my food to come? I'm going to enjoy myself. There is a powerful, valuable endurance is key. It really is. And without this endurance that is being built in us, again, it wouldn't be driving us closer and deeper into God. Endurance drives you into deeper relationship if you choose to. And if you don't choose to, you walk away and you choose doubt and fear again instead. See, folks, this is a matter of choices. We have free will. We are free to make choices. All the time, every day, every minute of the day, we are making choices. And building endurance and allowing it to drive you into the Lord even deeper causes you to hear the Holy Spirit more clearly, be able to get the right guidance that you need, be able to trust him more so that, oh, okay, I don't have to see 200 miles down the road before I take a step. Because that was me. I am a person, like, I like to know what's going to happen two weeks out. It, if it's not on my calendar within a week, I get agitated. I am not a last-minute person. I'm spontaneous when it comes to art, but as far as planning goes, I am not a last-minute person, and I will get very aggravated if someone tries to put a last-minute thing on my calendar. I am very protective of my calendar. <laughs> so I am learning how to relax a little bit. I am learning this very key picture that someone gave me. They said to me, Kathy, I see this road, like, path rolled up in front of you like a big roll of sod. And as you take a step, it unrolls. As you take a step, it unrolls. And God was saying, Kathy, trust me. Just trust me. So I'm learning that. So you endure until the breakthrough comes, because it will come. It says so in the scripture. It doesn't say endure, and I might or I might not. It says right here, where did, I just read it, where did it go? Maybe I didn't read it yet. I don't think I read it yet, but the scripture says you will be victorious. It doesn't say maybe. It says you will be. <laughs> and don't let your own understanding be the thing that supports you. Whoa, that's shaky ground right there. <laughs> I, this is the picture I like tend to draw in my mind because it helps me. I'm a very visual person, and I realize not everyone is visual, but I'm an extremely visual person. And so the picture I have in my head is this. Like, I picture the vastness of the universe, if it can even be pictured. And I picture me as this little pinpoint. 
And the universe is the totality and wholeness of God's nature. And I'm this tiny, tiny little pinpoint you can't even see in the midst of that. And so what that says to me is where I exist in that vastness is the level of my understanding of who God is. I only understand what's immediately around me. Tomorrow, I won't be here. I'll be over here. So what I was seeing from here looked like this, but when I got over there, I realized, oh, it actually looks like this. So here's what the conclusion I've come to in that. My understanding of who God is is constantly shifting and growing and changing. Constantly. If you think you understand God completely, you are not living in his universe. You are living in your own mind. And I will tell you that is a dangerous place to live. It's scary in there. It's really scary in there. <laughs> Which is why the Bible tells us to constantly renew our minds. So in the vastness of the knowledge of God, I understand this today, but I will understand that tomorrow. But from over here, that doesn't look like what it actually is. It looks like something else. And so if you can open your mind and your heart up to understanding that, that your understanding of who God is and how he functions and his nature is going to shift and change with every new revelation and every mystery that you don't get an answer to, then you are well on your way to a very intimate relationship with God. Ah, uh, here's the scripture I was talking about. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, We all experience times of testing. And I looked up that word. It actually uh, says temptation. Which is normal for every human being. Normal. If you're pursuing a Christian life with no testing and no temptation and no trouble, you're not normal. <laughs> it's normal for every human being. But God will be faithful to you. He will screen and filter the severity, nature, and timing of every test or trial you face so that you can bear it. Endure. And each test is an opportunity to trust him more. For along with every trial, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out of it victoriously. There you go. So regardless of what the circumstances say, you're coming out of it victoriously because he's provided the way of escape. But you need to have that intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit so you can discern the way of escape when it shows up. If you are stuck with a picture in your head of it has to happen a certain way and this is the way it's going to be done, I guarantee you, you are going to miss the Holy Spirit when he shows up and says... See that person sitting right over there? Nancy Hagen, she's the answer to your prayer. But because you don't know Nancy, you're not even going to go to her. And you're going to miss it. In the midst of all of this, these are a lot of things. I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff out, and I hope I'm making sense. Just kind of shout at me if I'm making any sense to anybody. Okay, all right. Sometimes when it's so quiet, you don't know whether to interpret that as they're bored out of their minds or they're just really listening. <laughs> um, now, in the midst of learning all of this, there's, there's something else I want to touch on, and that's keeping the hope in the midst of all of these questions and the disappointments and why God, I don't understand, and why do things seem to be getting worse and not better, and you know, all of those things. Um, 
It's okay to be disappointed. Just don't stay there. So what you do is you stay connected to your heart because that's where God lives. If you think what you feel in your heart and being in God's presence who lives in your heart can't exist in the same space, you're separating yourself from God and you're separating yourself from your heart. It's okay to be disappointed, but bring that disappointment with you into the presence of God and ask him to show you what he's doing with it. It's extremely powerful. And I know for me, I have had a lot of disappointments in the midst of this. And I was feeling particularly disappointed the other day um, I think it was last Sunday or two Sundays ago, I was having a conversation with um, someone here in the church, and they were sharing with me what was going on and, and whatnot. And I looked at them, I said, I'm going to pray that your husband has an encounter with God that frees him of that pressure that he's feeling, that frees him and gets him out from under the influence that he's under. And I didn't think twice about it. And I went home, and I forget what night it was I got the phone call, but this is what I remember. So I prayed that. I get a phone call from the wife. She said, I had to call you. She said, I was going to call you last night, but it was 12.30, and I didn't think you were up. And I was like, I'm always up at 12.30. And she said, I have to tell you, you prayed that prayer, and God answered it word for word. He was driving home from work at 9.30 at night, and all of a sudden he got hit like with a bolt of electricity, and God's presence completely filled the car, and God said to him, do you trust me? And then God spoke to him exactly what I prayed, and he was freed. Here's the really, really amazing part. When she called me, I was in the middle of a conversation with my husband, and I was saying to him, I've been praying for you for healing and praying for you for healing. Do you believe that you could be healed? And he said something to the effect of no or something like that. And in that moment, I got so disappointed and upset on the inside. I said, well, then why am I even continuing to pray if you don't even believe? Bam, the phone rings, and she says that to me. That was God's timing saying, Kathy, when you pray, I hear you. That was a powerful moment. So not only did this wife and husband get an answer and a freedom, I got an answer, all from the same situation, wrapped up together. Don't tell me that we are not in union together with each other and we aren't intertwined. We are so intertwined with one another. And that is clear evidence of that. I always hear you, Kathy. Like I said, we often think we have to leave our negative emotions out of God's presence, or, heaven forbid, don't even voice them because that's speaking against faith. There is nothing wrong with voicing what's going on in your heart. Like I said before, what's not good is making a statement that's not in faith and lacks any understanding. And I will hear people make statements without understanding what God is doing because the prayer hasn't been answered the way they wanted it answered or they expected it to be answered or when they wanted it answered, they'll say, oh, well, I guess it's just God's will. That's a negative statement. That's an ungodly belief. And it's coming from a place of lack of understanding. Those are the kinds of things we don't want to say, but it's okay to say, I'm depressed, I'm disappointed, I'm angry, I'm hurt, 
I'm fearful. God, can you show me and help me to understand why I feel that way? There's the change and the shift. That's faith. You are expressing your heart. You're bringing it into the presence of God with you. And then you are looking to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, who I love to say this, my friend says this all the time, and I love it, who knows everything about everything. And he does give you an answer. And he does bring healing. And he does bring hope. He really does. Your thoughts and your feelings are very precious to him. They're extremely, they're beautiful to him. However ugly you think they might be, they are beautiful to him because they're part of your heart. And he loves your heart, all of it. He lives in there. He knows it better than you do. He's in our heart all the time, rummaging around. We tend to go in there every so often and rummage around. So it's okay to cry out in disappointment. And I did that one night. I finally just... I had been trying to deal with it in the way that I dealt with a lot of things. And again, this was revelation to me. Uh, you know, I've had people say to me, you're such a strong person. And I would immediately say, no, I'm not. <laughs> because I know what's going on in here. Outwardly, I may be showing one thing sometimes, but I know what's going on in here. And we all do that. We all do that. Sometimes we just don't feel like talking about it. <laughs> so you pretend. And I had this dream about, I was running a women's luncheon, and I was so emotionally compromised because of the place I had been in, emotionally and mentally with everything going on in reality but in the dream I was emotionally compromised and I had this women's luncheon at my house and this big guest speaker was going to be there and I hadn't prepared a darn thing because I was so emotionally compromised and I was in a full-on panic three people showed up in my dream that I know in their real-life personalities the one person was very practical it's like well, just do what you got to do. Just get it done. The second person was um, very, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just figure it out on my own. I'll just do this and I'll do that and I'll take care of it. And, you know, I'll, I'll take care of these people and no worries and blah, 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 blah. And the third person was very... Just leave the mess. No one will notice. And when I woke up from the dream, I was upset. <laughs> I was mostly upset because in my liking to have my ducks in a row, I had had a dream about me really screwing up. <laughs> and then I said, Lord, what did that dream mean? And it wasn't until I began to write it out that I understood. God was showing me the way I tend to deal with things that come into my life that are difficult my responses tend to be just pick up my bootstraps and just do what I got to get done and keep pushing, keep moving. And another response is, well, I'll just take care of other people and I'll just do this over here and that over there. It'll all be good. And my other response is just throwing up my arms saying, you know what? Who cares? It's a mess. I, I just, I can't even be bothered. I, I can't even think about it. And that's how I was tending to deal with all of it. And God was saying, Kathy, I want you to stop doing that. I want you to bring all of that to me. And because none of those things were good and none of them were working and they were causing me even more stress. <laughs> and so it went back to trust again. It went back to trust. It went back to if I'm emotionally compromised and I can't accomplish something, then say so. Say, I can't handle this right now because I'm just not in a good place where I can think clearly and actually get something done. It's okay to say that. It's okay to say, you know what? I'm so bent on serving people as a way of ignoring my own issues that are going on emotionally. I'm gonna say no this time. And I'm gonna give myself room to breathe. And 
yeah, everything's a mess, but you know what? I'm going to admit that it's a mess, and I'm going to ask for help. Instead of feeling you have to protect, you have to guard, you can't be real. It's okay to be real. When I was crying out to God that night, and I was just, I was really, I was just so brokenhearted, and, you know, my husband's port surgery was upcoming, and I had just been praying and praying and believing, and I had people praying with me, and, and it just wasn't happening, the healing. And I was just so brokenhearted that I allowed myself, instead of picking myself up by my bootstraps and saying, okay, I'm going to deal with it. We're just going to do what we got to do. I let myself bawl my eyes out before the Lord, and I let myself tell him how disappointed and brokenhearted I was and that I didn't understand. It's written in my journal, and when I go back and read it, sometimes I'm like, wow, <laughs> that was intense. And here's what God said to me when I stopped crying and I sat for a moment. These were his exact words. If you focus on healing as the end goal, you will miss all the treasures I have for you to pick up along the way. Because my focus was so hyper-focused. Everything in my life was going and energies were going in that direction. My husband's got to get healed. And the intimacy level with God was way off to the left and the right. And in that moment, my heart came into a place of such rest and peace and I went, I can't trust him. I can, and I will. And I made a shift in that moment that I wasn't going to pursue healing as the end goal, that I was going to pursue the totality of God's nature, which includes healing. I was going to pursue his heart and I love in the scripture where Paul says, I purpose one thing to know Christ and him crucified. With all of the incredible speeches he gave and all the miracles and all the discipling, he says that. So in the midst of pursuing this part of God's nature we call healing, if we're not pursuing intimate relationship with him and with the Holy Spirit, we are prostituting the power and the miracles of God. It's that simple. It's through intimacy that healing comes. It's through this intimate understanding and revelation that healing will come. In a moment, in a brief moment, God can and will heal anyone, and he does. But in that moment, that person that he's touched has had this, this glimmer and this revelation of the nature of God in the midst of that that catapults them into a deeper knowledge of who he is, like that blind man who got healed. You're going to pray for me in the name of God I don't know and not tell me who he is? That, that seemed like to him like, What? How could you do that? <laughs> so the treasures are to have intimate knowledge of him and to have a deep, intimate experience with the Holy Spirit and then to respond to and obey what he says. Years ago, I had this experience where I was an avid coffee drinker, and I remember... God saying to me one day in my prayer time, I want you to stop drinking coffee. For whatever reason, it wasn't good for me. At that time, it was not good for me. And I said, okay. And I went and had my, my prayer and worship time. And I was laying on the floor, and I literally felt Jesus come and lay his hands on my head like this. And I thought, I don't know what you're doing, but it's okay with me, whatever you're doing, that's fine. And I had just made that decision that morning, I was going to stop drinking coffee. I never had one withdrawal headache. That's what Jesus was doing. Because I obeyed. I had intimate knowledge 
of what God was doing. I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to stop drinking coffee. I immediately responded and obeyed. Boom, miracle. No withdrawal headaches. Now, some people go, that wasn't really a miracle. Let me tell you, have you ever had a withdrawal headache? That was a miracle. <laughs> they hurt. They hurt really badly, and they go on for days. And so that's the reality of that. Your strength doesn't come from your understanding of what's going on. It comes from a passionate pursuit of knowing him. That's where your strength comes from. Understanding we need to pursue. The Bible says, get knowledge, and with your knowledge, get understanding. Just because you know something doesn't mean you understand it. And the Bible tells us to do that. But without that passionate pursuit of him, it's all just head knowledge. There's no power in it. And we will always reflect the nature of the world we are most aware of. Always. So whatever world you're most aware of, that's the nature you're going to reflect. I want to reflect the nature of God. And I'm learning to every day at a deeper level. I am by no means have arrived. I am going to go through the rest of my life and probably still not have arrived <laughs> to, the, to the absolute fullness. But I am telling you, what I have learned in the midst of this enduring with my husband's illness, enduring with him not seeing and manifest supernatural healing at this point, I have learned to hotly pursue God to the point where even if he shouldn't be healed, I am still going to hotly pursue God because that's where the treasure is. That's where the life is. That's where the hope is. Does God want to heal? Absolutely. Do I believe he wants to heal my husband? Absolutely. But until that day comes, I am going to endure, and I am going to endure with hope. And on the days I don't have hope, I'm going to come to you guys and get it. So you better have it. Because I'm not doing this alone. We do this together as a body. We are not alone. Guys, we move forward together. We are one body. One body. How weird would it be? Let's take Jeff. We're going to pick on Jeff. Jeff Gunther. And see his head over in the corner there talking, his arms running around the hallway, his legs up on the stage separate from each other running around. How weird would that be? <laughs> He's like, I could get more done that way. <laughs> None of it would work, and none of the parts would work independently. They'd be dead on the floor. Guys, we're one body. We work together. We work in unison. So when I'm having a bad day, I'm coming after you. Expect it. I'm going to say, Holy Spirit, tell me who I need to go to for prayer. And he'll tell me. You better be ready. <laughs> The other thing I heard said I really liked was, your shadow will always release what overshadows you. How many times do you hear people say, oh man, when that person's around, I just feel depressed. If they're overshadowed by depression, that's the shadow they cast. And people feel it. How we respond to it is the key. Let me pray for you. Do you believe God wants to release you from that depression? Because he will, and he can. Anything, it doesn't matter what it is. The lifestyle of the kingdom, and that's what we're talking about here, the lifestyle of the kingdom emanates from a yielded life 
and engaging with the Holy Spirit for a deeper, more intimate relationship. So it's about engaging the Holy Spirit in your daily life. And I heard something else said that I really liked. I've always been one to say, God is not easily offended, and he's not. If he were, he wouldn't be talking to any of us. Um, <laughs> um, but the Holy Spirit is, uh, the symbol of a dove is used because a dove is so peaceful and gentle and there's something about the nature of a dove. But this person went on to say, a dove by nature is also very nervous, kind of, you know, and easily scared. And although I don't believe for a minute God is nervous or easily scared, the next statement he made really stuck with me. He said, if a dove landed on your shoulder, how would you walk to keep the dove on your shoulder? And he then said, you take every step with the dove in mind. And although I do not believe the Holy Spirit is easily offended or scared, I do believe that when we take every step with the dove in mind, we've stepped into that intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Not just the abiding presence, but the intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because every step I'm taking with the Holy Spirit in mind. And that's what this walk is all about. Can I enjoy a glass of beer with the Holy Spirit in mind? Absolutely. He loves beer. I think. <laughs> and red wine. <laughs> so I'm not talking about, um, you know, simple daily pleasures. I'm talking about the things we, we think, the things we say, the things we do. And even more, I'm talking about the intimacy. If I'm taking a step into the realm of my husband having surgery, I want to do it with the Holy Spirit in mind. I want to hear him. I want to hear what he's saying every step of the way. Because that's going to sustain me. That's going to give me hope. And it can't be developed merely for the purpose of the miraculous, that kind of relationship. Then you reduce him to a principle rather than a person. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a principle. Principles are written on paper and read. Persons are experienced. There's no limit to what you can experience. And there's no limit to what I can experience, but there's a limit to what I'm experiencing right now at this point. Because I'm continuing to grow, I'm continuing to step into deeper intimacy, and so my experience will continually increase in the midst of that. So on this journey of healing, let's call it, I have realized that the greater journey is intimacy. Healing is all mixed up in that. It's part of the DNA of that. When and how that's going to happen, I have no clue. But you know what? I've come to a place where I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Because when God does show up and heal, I'm not going to miss it. <laughs> I'm not going to miss it. But it's that intimate relationship and that endurance and that hope that's constantly being built in me, constantly being built in me, that when the fullness of time comes for that healing, it's going to go into my pocket with all the other goodness things of God that he's done over the last couple years, and I'm going to have such a treasure trove and that healing is just going to be one little part of it. But it's all going to be precious treasure. All of it. So healing is not the only treasure. It is to be pursued. It is to be believed for. 
We will constantly go after it. We will not stop. But do not forget your heart and leave it behind. Do not ignore intimacy with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is where you live. That is where you exist. That is where your daily hope is. Are you still going to cry sometimes? Yeah. Are you still going to have disappointments? Absolutely. They're going to happen. The disappointments are merely things not working out the way we thought they would. But God has something better in mind, something much better. And that's an intimacy with him that cannot be shaken and opens doors that you didn't even know existed. We had somebody uh, just, I don't know, it was yesterday or the day before, my husband and I were in tears. I am, this Thursday, I'm going to do the testing to see if I could be a live donor for my husband. And that may or may not work out, we don't know. Um, have to have the testing done. But we had, I was having a conversation, talking with uh, another young lady, and um, she said, I didn't know that your husband was on dialysis. And this is a person I felt like I had to apologize to her. I felt so bad I hadn't said, told her about it personally. I think sometimes my wheels just spin so fast <laughs> that I lose things. But, um, she said to me, my husband wants to donate one of his kidneys. I, my husband and I burst into tears. And we thought, there's, there's two sides to love. There's the giving of love, which is very important. But then there's our ability to receive it. And in that moment, my husband and I knew God is teaching us to allow ourselves to receive unconditional love from others. And in that moment, it was as if an explosion of a picture of our union with one another together with Christ and the body of Christ came full-blown in my mind. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. That speaks volumes about us as a body and who we are as sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and supporting one another in the midst of what's going on. That's how we move forward. We move forward in, in intimacy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in intimacy with one another. That's how we move forward. That's how we begin to understand this thing called healing. Because I guarantee you, nine times out of ten, it's not going to look like what you expected. God loves to surprise us. And you can study all the different ways Christ healed in the Bible, and I guarantee you there's a million more different ones that will show up. Because it's just who he is. He heals you in the way that's going to speak the most deeply and intimately to you. He just doesn't do it as a doctor putting a Band-Aid on. He does it with an intimacy. I want to read one more scripture. I have no clue what time it is, and if I've gone way over, please forgive me. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I want to read this last scripture from Philippians 3, 12 to 16. I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the destiny that Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus, I forget all the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. 
I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all who are fully mature have the same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize following one path with one passion. That is the body of Christ. And I'm just going to read for you my, this is my favorite healing scripture. I don't know that I've ever read it as a healing scripture, but boy, when I read it, I thought, oh my gosh. So this is what I'm claiming on my husband's behalf from Philippians 3 as well, 20 and 21. But our passions are set on the heavenly realm as we cling tightly to our life giver, the Lord Jesus Christ the transformation of his body took place at his resurrection so that our bodies would also share in the same power, transfiguring us into the identical likeness of his glorified body. And by his matchless power, he continually subdues all that is within us to himself. My husband's body has been transfigured into the identical likeness of the glorified body of Jesus Christ. If you have sickness in your body, your body has been transfigured into the glorified likeness of the body of Jesus Christ, which is in perfect health. Amen.